Good evening, church family. I'm so glad that you've been watching and participating on these Wednesday nights. Over the past several weeks, I have so much enjoyed hearing from our pastor in Psalm 23. And tonight is about verse 6, at the end of the psalm. And I thought you would enjoy singing, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Let's worship and sing together. Shepherd, lead us, watch we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us, for our use thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast brought us thine we Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us Thine, we are. We are Thine, do Thou befriend us, be the guardian of our Flock from sin, defend us, seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, O oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and pardon free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thy will, blessed Lord and only Savior, with Thy love our beings fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the good shepherd. We can trust in you. Help us to trust. Help us to rely on you in this time of difficulty. We thank you for your love, your wonderful love that you have for us. Love enough 
that you died for us. You are the good shepherd. You are the lamb who was slain. And we thank you. And it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, Good evening. I'm Pastor Charles Kimball from First Baptist Shawnee. This is our midweek encouraging word that we're doing each week during the pandemic. We're going through the 23rd Psalm one verse at a time. Uh, Today we're ending uh, this study with verse 6 and I'd like to read the entire psalm and then we'll focus on verse 6. Would you pray with me and then we'll open up the word of the Lord together. Uh, Mighty God in heaven, uh, thank you for being our Heavenly Father. Thank you for being Jesus, uh, the Son who died for us and was raised from the dead. Thank you for being the Holy Spirit who lives in our hearts when we become Christians. And God, I I pray that this um, time of study and encouragement from your word uh, would just be a blessing to your people, an encouragement to your people who are listening and watching. Lord, speak through me, speak through your word, and may you be glorified in our lives in all that we do. And I pray, God, that the technology will help us and, and, and not get in the way of of teaching and hearing the gospel. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus, amen. The 23rd Psalm, I'm reading from the New International Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Since we're focusing on verse 6 this evening, can I read verse 6 again? Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever a great passage of scripture, makes two main points. Uh, First, we see that every day, God's goodness and love pursue us. There's nothing we can do to get away from God's goodness and love. They're always pursuing us. And the scripture says that God's love will pursue us all the days of our life. Think about that. Every day, every hour, every minute, every second, God's goodness and love are pursuing us. We can't get away from God's pursuit of us. God loves us that much. And I've talked with you all about our German shepherd, border collie mix, Amadeus, how he likes to pursue us. I get up in the morning, he follows me to the breakfast table. I go into the study to prepare my messages or have my quiet time with the Lord. He comes and lays down by my side. I get up for lunch, he's got his muzzle on my knee, hoping for a snack. And then wherever I go, if it's outside to grab the mail or back to the study, he's following by me by my side. And then finally with, at bedtime, he's got his doggy bed next to Connie's side of the bed and he'll come in and lay next to us. You know, all day long, he's pursuing me or pursuing Connie, depending who's at home. And so God's love is like that, uh, like that dog that loves us so much and always is wanting to be with us, God's goodness and love are always pursuing us. I remember watching the Fugitive remake with Harrison Ford and Tommy Lee Jones. And Tommy Lee Jones' character was relentless in his pursuit of Harrison Ford. He would not stop until he caught Harrison Ford. And God's goodness and love are like that. They do not stop pursuing us. And verse 6 isn't a hope or a prayer about God's goodness and love pursuing us. It's a reality. When Christ lives within our hearts, God's goodness and love are pursuing us. That's part of being in the presence of God. He's always pursuing us. Even when we have our darkest, most depressing, painful times in life, God's goodness and love are pursuing us. I love Psalm 107 verse 1, which says, For the Lord is good. His love endures forever. Both in the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament, there are several biblical words for love, each having different shades of meaning. And here in the Hebrew Old Testament, the word for love is hesed. It's the most important of the Hebrew words for love. It's it's much like our New Testament Greek word agape. 
And Hesed love is God's covenant love. It's his steadfast love. It's his loving kindness. It's his mercy and grace. It's his overwhelming love for us that is so big that he wants to be in relationship with us and pursues us to be in relationship with us for the first time. And then every day of our life, he's in pursuit of that relationship. And somehow if we get off track, God is pursuing us to bring us back on track into relationship with him forever. And God's Hesed love is so big, it caused him to send Jesus to, to reach down from heaven and become a man and die for us and be raised from the dead. God's goodness and love pursue us every day of our life. And think about this. God's presence brings his goodness and love with us, to us. And because of God's goodness and love, we can have peace in the midst of anxiety. We can have calm in the midst of fear. Um, we can have a, a sense of the presence of God even when we're worrying. And God can give us joy when human happiness won't cut it and we can't find it. There's a spiritual joy that rests upon us even if we're feeling discouraged and depressed. God forgives us when we turn away from him and God welcomes, and welcomes us back when we confess our sins and repent. As we go on to the next phrase, we see that God gives us eternal life in heaven. Uh, a statement of faith here, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We see, especially in the Gospel of John, that eternal life starts the moment you confess your sin and place your faith in Jesus. Eternal life isn't just something that happens on the other side of eternity, but God puts eternal life in us the moment we accept Christ. When Jesus talks about drinking the living water in, in places like John 4, it's receiving eternal life, a relationship with God for eternity. And that begins the moment we receive Christ and it'll extend when we close our eyes in death and open our eyes in heaven on the other side of eternity. Think about this. We're gonna live in heaven forever. And forever has a bit of a mystery to it. What, what does forever look like? How long does it last? It seems like we look forward to the next day, the next week, the next year sometimes, to, to graduation, to, to marriage, to some rite of passage in our life but it's hard to wrap our arms around that mystery of forever. And because God is an eternal God, he gives us eternal life in which we can live with him forever. On the night before his death, Jesus told his disciples, and he tells us in John 14, that I'm, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. I'm building a mansion for you in heaven. And when but that place is complete for you, I'm gonna come back and, and get you to bring you where I am. And so either at the return of Christ or at the end of our earthly life, Jesus will send his angels to bring us to heaven for all eternity and we'll, we'll be able to experience the presence of God face to face. We'll be able to sing with choirs of angels. We'll be reunited with our loved ones who know Christ, who've gone to heaven before us you know, our grandparents and our parents and, and Christian friends, you know, oh, what a day that will be when we get to spend eternity together in heaven. So I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we have to ask ourselves, do, do we have that kind of relationship with Christ in which we can have that assurance that we'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever? You know, one of the, the, the Baptist hallmarks of our theology is once we're saved, we're always saved. Once we confess our sins and place our faith in Christ, we're saved for eternity. We have eternal life for eternity. And if you're a person who hasn't accepted Christ yet, you can just reach out to him in faith, confessing him as Savior, Lord, and God, and believing he's the Son of God who died for you and was raised from the dead. Confess your sins to him, commit your life to his lordship, invite him into your heart, and Jesus will give you eternal life at, at that time. And you can begin this lifelong process of being a follower of Christ. That ends our study from Psalm 23, and we'll look to a new study next week. Each week, I've been sharing a, a top 10 list 
uh, different ways that you know God's working in my life or different things that God is teaching me. And so the top 10 list I have this week is 10 qualities I appreciate about the four gospels. I, I, through this time of pandemic, I've been especially looking at the four gospels, the life and ministry of Jesus and the Psalms. And I appreciate so much the, the gospels because they tell us the life and ministry of Jesus. So here are the 10 qualities I appreciate. Number one, the gospels are the most important part of the Bible. The 39 books of the Old Testament are all leading up to Jesus and the Gospels. Then we have the four Gospels, the, the stories of Jesus' life and ministry, his death and resurrection. And then after that, we have 23 New Testament books that are all an outgrowth, an elaboration of the Gospels or as people are living out the mission of Christ and living out a life with Christ through relationships with one another as Christians and through the church. Number two, the Gospels show us how Jesus used Scripture. You know, Jesus used Scripture to understand his, his life and his mission. My, my PhD dissertation, which was published over in Sheffield, England, was a, a study of how Jesus used Scripture, especially to understand his life and mission. And then beyond that, Jesus used Scripture to apply to every situation in life. When he was dealing with conflict, when he was dealing with difficulty, when he was dealing with challenges, when he was teaching theology on difficult subjects like heaven and hell, he always referred to the Old Testament scriptures, which were his Bible. Number three, the Gospels reveal Jesus' relationship with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. You know, God the Father, God the Son Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit, they've always been in relationship with one another throughout eternity, always in fellowship with one another. And so we're created in the image of God for relationship with God and for relationship with one another. And I, I love how the Gospel of John spells out the, the relationship that Jesus has with God the Father and Jesus has with the Holy Spirit, especially towards the end of the Gospel. You know, Jesus will talk about, I only do what the Father tells me to do. I only say what the Father tells me to say. And then when Jesus teaches about going away to prepare a place for us, he says, I'm sending the Holy Spirit to be with you and the Holy Spirit will do what I've, what I've told him to do. He'll teach you my teachings. And so we see how the three persons of the triune God work together and Jesus is right at the heart of how God works. Number four, the gospels show us how Jesus handled conflict. Jesus almost always cited scripture when he was handling conflict. And I find Jesus extending grace to broken, hurting people in the midst of conflict. And then with religious people who tended to be self-righteous or hypocritical, Jesus came right out and hit him with a spiritual hammer. Number five, the gospels reveal Jesus's heart for broken, wounded people, poor people, sick people, but people that had a lot of brokenness in their lives. He loved them. He saved them. He gave them wholeness and healing so often. And think about the, the sinful woman that anointed Jesus' feet in Luke chapter 9, that everybody despised, and Jesus held her up as the godly example. Or the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, Jesus saved her soul and then made her into one of the early Christian evangelists sharing the gospel with her community, many of whom came to Christ. And there's person after person like that. Zacchaeus, the despised tax collector, Jesus came into his house and changed his life and changed his family. Jesus has a heart for broken, hurting people. And if we're going to be like Jesus, we'll do that also. Number six, the Gospels give us unique insights into the life and ministry of Jesus. And we have four Gospels because although they, they, they cover the same life, ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus, they do it from different vantage points. And so with Matthew, we especially get a focus on the teachings of Jesus. We go to Mark, we especially get a focus on the actions of Jesus as it's, it's very fast paced. We move into Luke and Luke has a, a special heart for putting the telephoto lens of scripture on, on people who are broken and hurting. And, and also he puts a telephoto lens of scripture on the, on the women who were serving Jesus, working alongside uh, the disciples with Jesus. 
And then when we get to John's gospel, John has the, the I am sayings that give us so much wonderful truth, like I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. And then John's gospel gives us the Jesus' unique encounters with people that are not mentioned elsewhere in the scripture. I think about the Nicodemus and Jesus teaching Nicodemus on how to be born again, or the Samaritan woman and Jesus telling her how she can have the living water of a relationship with him. Number seven, the Gospels show us the importance of working together as Christians, as a church, as a team. Jesus never seemed to do ministry alone. He was always doing it with others, setting the example for us. So Jesus had the 12 disciples. He had a greater group of 70 disciples. He had a group of, of women followers who worked alongside the disciples, often behind the scenes to provide for the needs of his ministry. And then there were others. And if we're going to be like Jesus, we'll find ways to cooperate together, work together. Number eight, the Gospels affirm the importance of relationships. You know, think of Jesus. He's the all-powerful God, the creator and sustainer of the universe. But in his humanity, Jesus needed relationships with people. And so he had the, a, a broad group of friends, the 12 disciples. He had an, an inner circle of Peter, James, and John. And then he had one best friend with John. And, and all of us, like Jesus, need those circles of relationships. We need the ca more casual relationships of 12. We need um, intimate relationships with a handful of people. And we need a very best friend. God's designed us that way. Number nine, the Gospels give us our mission, the Great Commission. And our mission is to go and make disciples of all nations. And that means we, we pray for people who need Christ. We share the gospel with people who need Christ, and those who come to Christ, we disciple them through the church. Number 10, the gospels remind us that being a Christian isn't all about us. Being a church member isn't all about us. It's really about Jesus and about others, and we find our, the greatest joy, peace, and meaning in life when we're not focusing on us, but when we're focusing on God and others. And Jesus said in Luke 9:23. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. That screams against everything we hear in this world about finding meaning and happiness in life, because so much in, in our culture is, is about getting and, and about personal fulfillment. And Jesus says, you know, real happiness is found in denying your own needs to meet the needs of others taking up our cross daily, which means putting your, your agenda and your interest to death daily, and then to follow him. And when we follow Jesus, we find ultimate meaning in life. These are my top 10 from the Gospels. I hope God speaks to you through them, and we'll have another top 10 list next week. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your goodness and grace in our lives. God, from, from Psalm 23, Lord, uh, just give us strengthening of our faith, joy and peace in our faith. Lord, from the Gospels, Lord, help us to be more like Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.